Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this episode of Threat Talk. I'm your host, Bob Hansman, and today we're going to talk about how threat actors are also really incredible makeup artists. In order to penetrate defenses, both human and technological, they have a suitcase full of tools that they use to make any threat look innocent and evenly desirable. Now, to help us understand how attackers are blending this social engineering and technology, other tricks and methods in order to disguise the true intent of an attack, we have with us today, Drew McFarland, Senior Product Manager for Threat Intel at Infoblox. Thanks for uh, joining us again here, Drew. Uh, thank you for having me again, Bob. It's, it's great to be here. Yeah, we try to make it a semi-annual thing at least here. <laughs> um, now, finding places to post malware. I remember this a long time ago. Um, you know, they can spoof email addresses and stuff like that, but the actual location on the internet to host the malware and disguise it, um, they put a lot of effort in that because it's hard to find a place because they'll get banned by the, you know, whoever the provider is, the provider kind of learns what's going on. Um, so they do everything they can to hide the location, but they're also trying to make sure that it's not too obvious what they're doing. So there's plenty of information on phishing themes and, and topics and how they try to look legitimate. But while it's easy to make an email with the right graphics and the fonts and the words, it's difficult to find someplace to find on the internet that aligns with that theme. I mean, they might compromise. I remember one where they compromised a, uh, a carpenter in Finland, but we're trying to make it look like a Bank of America site. Um, but if you looked at the URL, this was like 25 years ago, if you looked at the URL, it was obviously not Bank of America. So update us on the techniques that they're using in order to disguise these kinds of links. Yeah, so um, so obviously there you know, we talk about lookalike domains and lookalike domains actually you know, sort of span a gamut of different techniques that, that people can uh, can utilize to try to uh, you know, basically try to uh, make the user feel like they're interacting with a trusted source. So, you know, one of the more common ones, and, and that's kind of for the, the purpose that you were talking about right there, uh, to at first blush be able to fool a user into thinking that they're going to Bank of America. Uh, there are ways of doing uh, basically character substitution, um, you know, uh, homographs, homoglyphs, where basically what they're trying to do is make uh, make the URL look as close as possible to what they're trying to imitate as possible. And sometimes they'll they'll swap out uh, you know uh, normal uh, codes for acrylic uh, acrylic letters, et cetera. So you know, um, or maybe there's a you know like if they're trying to go for Google, they'll substitute the O for a uh, for a zero as an example. So if you know, if you're not really looking carefully, uh, it's it's not all that obvious that you're not clicking on the site that you think that you're actually going to. So it would be very easy to create a uh, with a lot of different options and things like that. There's a lot of different ways of being able to make something that would look very close to Bank of America or Google, so that you know you wouldn't realize that you weren't interacting with the actual target that you're trying to do. Uh, other ways that they'll try to uh, you know, influence people is by you know not trying to necessarily make the uh, the domain name you know different at all. So in other words, you've got you know something like Bank of America, but they may prepend it or append you know the actual term Bank of America with something that looks legitimate, like accounts payable dot you know uh, hyphen Bank of America dot com. You know might actually be something. So you know, it's not actually owned by the by the vendor, but there's enough of the uh, correlated, uh, you know, target uh, domain in there that it might make you think that you're actually dealing with a legitimate source. So, you know, often, you know, the the different organizations are out there. They're trying to defend their intellectual property. They'll actually go out and buy a whole bunch of these different uh, domains just to try and get some of the low hanging fruit. But the unfortunately, the the adversaries can be very creative as well. Well, and I remember, uh, actually, I think I saw it on a T-shirt first, but I've also seen it on LinkedIn and in professional circles where there will be a statement that says, this doesn't say what you think it does. And they <laughs> swap words around because the human mind, we are expecting to see certain things, you know, like, oh, this looks like a Bank of America web uh, or uh, email. And so they don't notice the discrepancies because their mind automatically corrects it and makes it look legitimate. So even though that O is a little odd, 
um, the human mind uh, is, is a trick. So it's like these guys are not just makeup artists, but they're they're magicians. They're doing that thing to to let your own mind trick you. Um, and then I remember uh, you mentioned this actually in an earlier uh, episode where typo squatting. There's a lot of common things again getting to the human element when we uh, say, "Oh no, I'm not going to be fooled. I'm not going to uh, click on that link. I'm going to type in Bank of America." And there's common typos that people make. And they get those domains as well, correct? That that's absolutely true. So there's uh, and there's actually two different techniques there. There's the you know inadvertent uh, typo squat where you mean to type a W and you end up typing you know one of the surrounding characters, the E or the Q or or whatever. So they'll buy different permeations of, of that. The other one is unfortunately as uh, as the internet has grown, uh, you know a lot of the best domain names are, are kind of gone as well. So as a result, you have uh, you know companies that will just say that they've gotten very creative with making up names that don't actually mean anything. Unfortunately, those made-up names can sometimes, <clears throat> if you're familiar with it auditorially, you know you don't necessarily know how it's spelled. So you know, there's one you know, like a, you know, there's one company that you could potentially spell the yeah, the company name five or six different ways, and if they don't, if they're not careful to go up and buy up all the different misspellings. You know, people can absolutely go in and, and buy and squat on some of those other, uh, you know, other misspellings of the name. Yeah. And on your example of where they'll, you know, either they'll, they'll put some additional text like payments dash Bank of America. I've seen uh, and received some that it would say it wasn't a Bank of America one, but we'll continue that example. It said <laughs> Bank of America. They're not sponsoring com. us, are they? I just want to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to pull their sponsorship if we keep talking about them <laughs> being attacked. Um, yeah. uh, but to be fair, this is not their fault, uh, other yeah. than the fact that they are they got a big red target on them, uh, much like Microsoft. I remember the early days, everybody would get breached and they go, oh, there's a vulnerability in Microsoft. It's all Microsoft's fault. Well, today we know that every product's got vulnerabilities. Back then they just targeted Microsoft because they were the the 800 pound gorilla and they had the best chance of, of getting victims if they if they used those kinds of, of attacks. But I saw one that it was, you know, like bankofamerica.com dot and then some other domain because, you know, this is where the bad guys are taking things that we've done on the internet to make it easier, make it simpler, make it more user friendly. Um, like you mentioned that they can change um, and it doesn't have to be English text. It could be Cyrillic. There's even Cherokee. Um, there's a Cherokee font set. Um, so there's, there's dozens and dozens of languages and there are letters in those other languages that look exactly like letters that you might be looking for. Um, you know, we tend to, cause this is an English show. We're going to give the example of bank of America. They'll find a lowercase O, but they'll replace it with something that just looks like a lowercase O in a whole nother language set, but they yeah. do the reverse too. So, um, for those of you who are, uh, you know, English is a secondary language for you, uh, be aware that your language is also targeted using these exact same methods. Um, so it's, it's just interesting to me how they take all this good stuff and and pervert it um yeah. you know and unfortunately that's the way the the bad guys mind but yeah. we've used a lot of email um but i want to be clear this is not exclusive to email right there's some other uh, ways that all this is used. yeah well there's the entire uh, miter attack chain and and email has a tendency of being one of the earliest entrees of this but usually when you're dealing with a look like domain it's not just the the email address that, that it's coming from. It will be you know, there's going to be some sort of an embedded link that that's that they're going to try to get you to interact with them in some way, uh, and that's usually what ends up happening. So it could be coming through by an email. Uh, it could be any number of things. Uh, you know, but you know, the idea there is the, they're mm -hmm. trying to host some sort of content that they want you to interact with. Uh, you know, maybe it's to download malware. Maybe it's to uh, steal credentials. If you think that you're dealing with uh, uh, Wells Fargo, we'll, we'll, we'll give them some love <laughs> and uh, instead of Bank of America. And, uh, you know, and they create a, a website and instead of a W, there's two Vs. So it kind of looks like a W. Um, so you think that you're dealing with Wells Fargo. And if that's your bank, you might very easily go in there and enter in your credentials to log in. And lo and behold, they've, they've got your, uh, your entire 
uh, you know, account uh, capabilities right there. So yeah, it's it's um, you know these things don't necessarily have to be rocket science. To your point, you know the entire concept of lookalikes it's really about social engineering, and uh, it doesn't have to be you know some incredible exploit of a zero day ex or whatever. No, they they could just be going in there to do something very very rudimentary. Uh, uh, you know, Kevin Mitnick was very, is one of the more you know, uh, famous, uh, more, I uh, don't want to say popular, but one of the more famous uh, hackers out there. And from a technical standpoint, what he did wasn't necessarily rocket science. It was all about getting people to believe that they were interacting with a trusted entity. And uh, if you get past mm -hmm. that, you know, the rest is pretty simple. Well, and in this line of the financial institutions, we'll, we'll throw in PayPal and a few others. Um, I've seen this where they set up a fake website. Um, like you said, they'll they'll set up one with uh, for Wells Fargo, but they'll use two Vs. So it looks great. Then they'll go and uh, get all the other domains that are common typo squatting or any other way they're going to attack. They may do it through social media. They may do it through email. And all of these things will auto redirect people yeah. to the one site. So they don't have to maintain 50 sites because they have 50 domains. They'll have 50 domains, but they all route to a common yeah. one that nobody, you know, will even know the difference. Um, and, uh, and, and that's where instead of, they don't even download malware. I mean, we still see the ones, uh, my wife got one here not too long ago, but of course she's kind of picked up a few things from me here. Mm -hmm. And she noticed right away that it was, um, it was a, uh, it was one of those reports that there was a problem with a transaction and she had just conducted a transaction on PayPal and the air. I mean, the timing was so perfect. The bad guys didn't know how perfect they did this, <laughs> but it hit her. And so she went to the web page and it said that, you know, it, you know, for to understand what the error was in her, you know, log in. But she noticed that the fields for the login and I'm looking at this, I'm going, what's wrong with it? And she looked at me like you dummy, you know, you, you work in security and you don't notice. Well, I don't use PayPal. Um, but she noticed that the fields were on the wrong side of the screen. Yeah. They had yeah. duplicated a page. <clears throat> I dug into it and stuff. They duplicated the page um, that was used in another country in another language. Um, but the one in English, the format was different. And she noticed the format change. And, mm -hmm. and But there was no malware involved. They just wanted her to type in her credentials. Yeah. And then they would have had control of her account. And uh, and this is, I mean, like one of the more insipid aspects. You're like, you, know, you and I, you know, we're we're both in the security space. We're we're trained to look for this stuff, and we're not even immune to this. And I can't tell you how many times I have been saved from myself by the fact that I use a password manager. Uh, so you go to some place that uh, that's asking you for, and just the simple fact that you know one pass, yeah, you know, one password knows enough not to put my uh, my credentials in there. He was like, oh, I wonder why it's not, you know, not automatically filling these fields out. Oh, it's because I'm not interacting with who I thought I was. So, you know, there, there's you know, sometimes uh, benefits on that line as well. Just, you know, like, because the, these people are very good. They, they know how to get you. And then uh, the, you know, some of the adversaries out there, they will, you know, they will even go out there that, you know, you have, you know, somebody tried to log into your account. You need to change your password now. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're banking on the fact that we're paranoid about this. This very type of thing. So when you when you they get an alert like that, it goes past any sort of you know it goes right to the uh, the emotional response, which is I've got to do something, uh, which is again you know, you know uh, the I think some of the best hackers are are probably neuroscientists. So they they really know how to uh, how to uh, you know tweak the right uh, the right responses uh, you know in in people's behavior. Yeah, I think. Um... The death, disaster, and drama are the three most yeah. successful themes used in these kinds of attacks because in all three of them, it's going to be emotional. I remember when Michael Jackson passed away and there were all these donate to this cause and donate to that cause. And um, I actually was looking for this because um, of something I was writing uh, at the same time this week here. And I couldn't find the the source, but I remember reading something, a report about two weeks into the Michael uh, Jackson, you know, sympathy and and violation of of his his death. And they said that over seventy percent of all the sites 
asking for donations to help this cause or that cause because that's what Michael Jackson asked people to do. They always said that, yeah. you know, Michael Jackson didn't ask people to, you know, do anything but donate to this cause. Mm-hmm. Um, but they were fake. Almost 70% yeah. of them were fake uh, websites. And we see that we see fake websites on uh, we just had uh, Chance Tutor on the show here a couple weeks ago talking about a malvertising website where they set up mm-hmm. fake websites around products and then they actually pay legitimate money and put legitimate ads on legitimate (laughs) websites um, to trick you into going to these fake stores and and, uh, fake advertisements. Yeah. And and the, the, and the thing about you, like the, 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 the thing about this entire industry is uh, you know, that, you know, we, uh, we are in a different world now because they figured out how to monetize a lot of this. So there's a financial backing to it that really wasn't there in the early days where where hackers were out there to, you know, maybe be a little bit mischievous and you know, maybe do some uh, uh, some vandalism on the website or here or there. But now that there's a real you know monetary basis behind it, you know, both with things like ransomware and and even things like this credential stealing, uh, what you'll find is that they've gotten really, really good. There's a, uh, I, I, I've forgotten the, the exact one, but if you look back at, at some of the white papers that we've released, shortly after the Ukraine uh, war broke out, uh, there was an influx of, of websites, both good and bad, trying to collect money for donations for, for people. Uh, and in the, in the white paper that we created, we actually have two different examples. One is a legitimate one, you know, asking for funds, you know, you know, donations. One was a fake one. Uh, the fake one looked far more professional. I mean, if you were to look at the two web pages and guess which is the one that's trying to uh, scam you and which one is the one that you know that uh, you know is is done by a uh, you, know, you know by a hacker, you know, you would be hard pressed just by looking at it. And we we were able to identify it not by necessarily the content, but you know, just simply by inference, uh, you know, knowing that. This site, you know, this this website itself uh, was hosted on the same website that we've known other scams to come from. So that was a big indicator. And actually, if you looked at the the terms and conditions on the bottom of the page, it reflected a different scam that they were doing. You know, like it had nothing to do even with uh, uh, you know, they were rushing so quickly to come, uh, you know, come to market with it that they hadn't done all their homework and they were. I think that they referenced something like, you know, like you said, you know, Michael Jackson or something. It was some other scan that they had left in, you know, reference to inside the web page, which let us know that it was uh, the wrong one. But, you know, it's amazing. Uh, you know, they've, they've got, uh, they have entire staff, uh, you know, developing these things. They've got graphic artists. They don't expect it to look uh, amateur hour. These, these people are uh, making a lot of money for a reason. And they're, they're devoting it back to their, uh, uh, their own uh, their own projects, which is uh, which is interesting. But yeah, it's there's a financial uh, there's a financial aspect of this that is uh, is growing in nature, and it's it's becoming a really big problem. Well, and yeah, they uh, they're they're taking some of these um, these websites and and so forth that, that they've created, and they're just repurposing it. They went to an awful lot of work. I've seen them where they A-B test. I remember doing some research into a particular uh, attack and they had three different websites all on the same theme, same concept, um, and pretty much the same information, but they rearranged them different. They used different colors on one. One had lots of pictures, one had a video, and they figured out which one worked. And then two of them disappeared about a week into the attack because they found the first one was the one that was being the most effective. And it had to do with current events. They had to keep updating it, which is why they got rid of the other two, um, because they wanted to only update the one that was working the most. And then later, when that event went away, that was, I think, an earthquake uh, situation, then some completely different thing. It wasn't even a natural disaster. It was more like a, 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 you know, explosion at a petroleum plant or something like that. We found the not only the the same template, but they'd left it on the same site. Um, yeah. They 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 created a fake news organization, and they had the domain name, so it just looked like a generic little news. Because today, people, you know, I I use Google. My wife uses another another feed, and we found, you know, we just if it's in the feed, we assume that it's a good news story. 
and it's a legitimate news organization. And I'm clicking on com companies I've never heard of. I'm reading yeah. articles on sites I I would never have thought to go to because I again I'd never heard of them. So these guys were reusing the same properties and everything. But um, now well, when when you just look at how often. Uh, stories from the onion end up inside of your legitimate news feed. You realize that you can't necessarily trust the legitimacy of anything that you see kind of coming through. It's not necessarily vetted as well as we'd like them to be. <laughs> you mean Google's not perfect? <gasps> I'm shocked. Oh my heavens. We, we may yeah. get, just get kicked off the internet now. I think they run the whole thing. Um, <laughs> but um you know, we, we just passed Halloween and we've been talking about a number of, you know, kind of scary stories, but I'd like to move on to some of the security options. And you've actually started to talk about this a, a moment ago. Um, you were talking about what you look at and why some of these things um, on that one attack, you found some indicators deeper in the page. That's something our researchers had. But also um, you guys are looking at like domains and IP address level information, stuff that yeah. at DNS, people can't lie. I, that's one thing I like about DNS. Um, I can put in a fake URL, I can substitute O's and I can make it look just like whoever it is I'm trying to pretend to be. But I have to give DNS the right name and DNS is going to come back with the right IP address. And it won't yeah. be the IP address of who I was faking to be. Yes. So yeah, so, we've, uh, yeah. Uh, so I was just gonna say, so I'm I'm just kind of curious. Um, what are some of the other things besides just I mean DNS security? We talk a lot about that on the show, but yeah. you know, right now there's a lot of things that email does. They scan attachments. You know, that's something your your email security solution does is scan attachments. Um, they're gonna they scan for some text, but even that. I mean, now we get emails that have a capital T, a lowercase h, <laughs> and a capital E for the word the. Yeah. <laughs> and that no no human would really want to do that in a real communication, but it's enough that it throws off email security and even your web securities and things like that. They'll do those kinds of things. Um, so there's so many ways that they're getting around it. What kinds of tools do we have to defend against all of those kinds of evasion techniques? Yeah. So uh, so you know, first of all, I'll say that you know, uh, from a philosophical standpoint, what we're trying to move toward is you know there's a you know you know if, what we've been talking about where we talk about shift left, which is we, you know, really the goal here is, uh, you know, if you think about the, the miter kill chain, uh, there's lots of different spots that you can try to attack, uh, uh, to uh, capture something, you know, the, in the best case scenario, you want to stop something as early as possible. If, you know, to take a football analogy, you want to tackle them in their end zone, not in yours. Uh, you want to stop things as early as possible. So, you know, uh, lookalikes is is kind of an interesting process that we do mainly because you know when you think about the miter kill chain, if you catch something while it's while they're registering the domain, you're you're catching it while they're trying to set up some sort of a, a campaign. Uh, you're stopping it before it even starts, which is really good. Uh, but beyond that, you end up having uh, some you know some difficulties. Like unfortunately, the like I said, there's a bit of a whack a mole. Uh, scenario when it comes to some of these adversaries where they they get kind of privy to what what the you know what people on our side are doing uh and a, a technique that was very uh, very popular for a while there was figuring that okay a lot of these a lot of these domains they're very ephemeral they they come up they 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 work you know they get discovered they burn them they they move on uh so there was a, a technique that you know and there are several different feeds that you could do to be able to try to stop that, where you look for, you know, you want to block something when it's newly registered or when the, when you first see it becoming active, um, you know, and, and you know, that's not a, necessarily a bad thing because if you stop something, something newly registered, if it's just been registered, the likelihood that it's actually mission critical to your organization is pretty low. Um, so you can block those things pretty safely, even if they are benign, just simply because, you know, what are they going to be doing that's that critical in the first 24 hours, right? Uh, but unfortunately, you know, uh, the adversaries got sort of privy to that. So they they bought these domains and then they sit on them for a month and then they go active. So then they, the, the thought was, okay, well, let me get it when we first start seeing it go active. Uh, you know, so they got privy to that. So what they do is they have these domains, they buy them, they sit on them for a month. 
then they start sending some benign traffic to it for a while. So it gets past that point of activity and then they can go ahead and start launching the, so you know, it, it's, it's always kind of this, uh, this moving down the, down the line thing. So you know, uh, we've got some different techniques of being able to try to catch and, and block stuff you know, at the point where it makes the most amount of sense, not when it's brand new, not necessarily when we first see traffic, but when we start seeing maybe like the hockey stick or whatever. So there's some some patented techniques that we've got for being able to uh, to look for for sites along those lines. But aside from that, there's a uh, you know there's basically an entire philosophy that we're starting to uh, look at here, which was you know up until now you know we had been focusing primarily on uh, you know, on things that were definitely malicious. And that means that like, we've seen something, you know, you know, it's a malware download site, or it's a, you know, uh, it's a command and control where we know exactly that it's bad and we know exactly why. Uh, but then there's this entire category of stuff that we were finding that, you know, because we're starting to look at things so early in the chain, we haven't seen it bad yet. We haven't, you know, we don't have the smoking gun saying this thing is absolutely bad. So there's a class of, of, indicators that we have now called suspicious and suspicious means we don't necessarily know that you know, this is exactly why it's bad but it's kind of like you know we, we we've done the, the the profiling the guy's wearing the gang colors we haven't seen him stick anybody up yet but you know you know all of his friends are in jail <laughs> like you know like you know, so you know we look at a whole bunch of aspects of stuff that we can be actually aware of even when the device uh, comes on and there's you know like who were they registered with where are they, you know, who's actually hosting their domain names? Who's hosting their website? You know, were there any other things associated with any of those things? So we start looking at reputation of the registrar, looking at the reputation of the web server, looking at the re reputation of the DNS server. You know, all those things can start to paint a picture as to whether or not there's any legitimacy to this. You know, like on top of the fact that it may be brand new, it may be brand new and that's not enough to necessarily make you want to block it. But it's brand new and it's also looking like a lookalike. Well, it may or may not, but if it's brand new and it's a lookalike and it's hosted on a server that you know has been you know hosting five or ten other bad things and it's you know done with this registrar and 95% of the stuff that this registrar uh, registers have all ended up being malicious. We don't know that this thing's absolutely malicious, but you should probably block it nonetheless. There's no legitimate purpose that we've been able to see there. So this entire concept of uh, of suspicious domains has actually you know, sort of blossomed out to uh, be a really good source of, um, of threat intelligence for our platform. So you go in there and, and you know, once you're able to factor all those things together, it all paints a pretty, pretty compelling picture. Well, and I was also kind of, I mean, unfortunately we're running out of time here. We were going to go into some mobile stuff. I had a long list of things to go in here. So we'll that's have to have you, you back. Yeah. Maybe that, after that's, the holiday. That's the way our, our things end up going. It's like, well, we like to apologize to Matt Damon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I do want to highlight uh, for our listeners, because a lot of them are not as familiar with the Infoblox products that, you know, you've been talking about different kinds of feeds like newly observed domains or nod feeds, um, you know, and, and then suspicious feeds, which are the ones you've just added, which, and you didn't just add one, you've added like three tiers. So, you know, how yeah. sensitive are you to suspicious, high, medium, low? Yeah. Um, you you actually manage a lot of different feeds, which is one of the big things and why we have you here is because um, most security vendors, you buy the product and you get a feed. <laughs> and you have to trust them that their feed has blended things from because they'll, they'll go to open source, like the anti-phishing working group's been around forever. And if you want to block phishing emails, you can go to them and, and import their data. And that's one of the things that a lot of vendors do. But they've gotten so, uh, so <laughs> I can't even talk now. It is time to end. But there were, the bad guys have gotten so sophisticated that we need to uh, have a blend of different kinds of approaches that just you know, a list of known phishing isn't going to deal with the zero days and all of those. So we'll have yeah. to have you back to go into that. So um, anything you want to say in our last two minutes before we wrap up? Um, but we will have you back, I'm sure. <laughs> no, uh, absolutely. No, it, uh, it's been it's been great to be here. And, and to your point there, one of the uh, one of the difficulties that every organization has is to your point, um, that a lot of uh, security vendors out there treat 
uh, treat their threat feeds like it's a one size fits all. And you, you don't want to buy your threat intelligence off the rack. Every different organization has slightly different uh, sensitivities to, to, you know, I wouldn't want to have the same um, threat profile for, you know, for my target point of sales terminals as I would for my guest network. Uh, those are two different use cases. There are two different levels of sensitivity. Uh, you know, if you try to, you know, if you try to apply the, you know, what you do to your guest network on your on your data center, you know, you're going to be letting stuff in that you don't want to. But if you try to apply the same rules to your data center to your guest network, you're going to be making it very uncomfortable for people to just be able to get their normal jobs done. So, um, you know, it's really you, know, you should have the flexibility of being able to figure out exactly, you know. What is the appropriate level for you, and and let's let, let's kind of tune that in appropriately for you. So don't buy off the rack. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for being with us again today, Drew. Great to be here. And thank you to all of our viewers and listeners for your time. Join us next time as we continue our efforts to help you stay on top of cybersecurity and ahead of cyber risks on Threat Talk.